with great devotion the time of our Lord's passion and resurrection and prepared for this by a season of penitence and fasting. By carefully keeping these days Christians take to heart the call to repentance and the assurance of forgiveness proclaimed in the gospel and so grow in faith and in devotion to our Lord. I invite you therefore in the name of the church to a continued observance of a holy Lent by self-examination and repentance, by prayer, fasting and self-denial, and by reading and meditating on God's holy word. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you, and also with you. Let's pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. You enter the desert to face the hardest truth. We live in self-perception. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You offer the bread that gives true life. We consume what leaves us craving more. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You refuse to worship empty power. We let greed rule our world. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Let me be like you in all my ways. Give me your strength. Teach me your song. Shelter me in the shadow of your wings. For we are your righteousness If we die to ourselves And live through your death We shall be born Again to be blessed in your love Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, let me be like you in all my ways. Give me your strength, teach me your song, shelter me in the shadow of your wings. For we are your righteousness. 
If we die to ourselves and live through your death, we shall be born again to be blessed in your love. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Let me be like you in all my ways. Give me your strength. Teach me your song. Shelter me in the shadow of your wings, for we are your righteousness. If we die to ourselves and live through your death, we shall be born again to be blessed. We shall be born again to be blessed in your love. May the love of God bring you back to himself, forgive you your sins, and assure you of his eternal love in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus, our brother, you followed the necessary path and were broken on our behalf. May we neither cling to our pain where it is futile, nor refuse to embrace the cost when it is required of us, that in losing ourselves for your sake, we may be brought to new life. Amen. Amen. We will now hear our reading. The first reading comes from Genesis chapter 17, from verses 1 to 7, then from verses 15 to 16. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be called Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. God also said to Abraham, As for Sarai your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be called Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. This is the word of the Lord. Reading from the New Testament, Romans chapter 4, verses 13 to 25. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be Heirs of the world did not come through the law but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings rest but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be granted 
to all his offspring, not only to the adherence of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations, as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, or when he considered the barrenness of sorrow's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness, but the word it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also it will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. قرأت عهد جديد رومیان چارده تا بیست و پنج از راه شریحت نبود که به ابراهیم و نسل او وعده وعده داده شد که وارث جهان خواهند شد بلکه از راه آن پارسایی که بر پایه ایمان است زیرا اگر آنان که به نظام شریعت تعلق دارند وارث باشند ایمان بی ارزش می شود و وعده باطل زیرا شریعت به غضب می انجامد اما جایی که شریعت نیست تجاوز از شریعت هم نیست از همین رو وعده بر ایمان مبتنی است تا بر پایه فیض باشد و تحقق آن برای تمامی نسل ابراهیم تضمین شود یعنی نه تنها برای آنان که به نظام شریعت تعلق دارند بلکه برای کسانی نیست که پیرو به ایمان ابراهیم هستند که پدر همه ماست چنان که نوشته شده است تو را پدر قوم های بسیار گردانیدم و در نظر خدا چنین نیز هست خدایی که ابراهیم به او ایمان آورد او که مردگان را زنده می کند و نیستی ها را به هستی فرا می خاند. با اینکه هیچ جایی برای امید نبود ابراهیم امید را امیدوارانه ایمان آورد تا پدر قوم های بسیار گردد چنان که به او گفته شده بود که نسل تو چنین خواهد بود او در ایمان خود قوی بود و شکست نخورد آنگاه که بر بدن مرده خیش نظر کرد زیرا حدود 100 سال داشت و رحم سارا نیز مرده بود اما او به وعده خدا از بی ایمانی شک نکرد بلکه در ایمان استوار شد به خدا را تجدیل نمود او یقین داشت که خدا قادر است به وعده خود وفا کند به همین سبب برای او پارسایی شمرده شد و این عبارت برای او شمرده شد تنها در حق او نوشته نشد بلکه در حق ما نیست تا ابد برای ما نیست شمرده می شود ما که ایمان آوردیم با او که خداوند ما عیسی را از مردگان برخیزانید او به خاطر گناهان ما تسلیم مرگ گردید و به خاطر پارسا شمرده شدن ما از مردگان برخیزانیده شد. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
praise to you, O Christ of the wilderness, who teaches us that one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus began to teach his disciples that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd of his disciples and said to them, If any wants to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake, and for the sake of the gospel, will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in glory of his Father with the holy angels. <laughs> This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Good morning. And it's very good to be with you on this second Sunday of Lent. The first Christians had no access to the stories of Jesus in the Gospels as we know them. Yet this mattered not because they were fired by a deep conviction over the power of the cross for their lives. The crucified Lord was their saviour and deliverer. Something in the crucifixion had demonstrated to them that the man of Galilee was the way to salvation. The tree of shame was their tree of glory. And this primary recognition of the power of the cross for Christian living is conveyed succinctly by Paul in his first letter to the Corinthian Christians. As he begins the correspondence, he articulates a significant anxiety, which is that the cross of Christ might be emptied of its power. He sees a risk that it may get obscured or marginalised. Yet this cannot be allowed to happen. For, as Paul writes, whilst the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. No cross, no power, no gospel. Paul goes on to say that this message of the cross captures the soul in a way that goes far beyond the wisdom of the wise and is so much more durable than the search for signs. He says, Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. And perhaps most memorably, Paul declares that whilst he could have come to the Corinthians speaking about mysteries and lofty wisdom, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Nothing else mattered, and arguably nothing else matters still. The cross of Christ turns his healing, transforming, justice-founded ministry into a way of salvation. Now, we all know this to be perhaps the truth of our faith. And this morning we are challenged by having this proclamation of saving grace turned directly towards us. Because this is what happens in Mark chapter 8, when Jesus addresses the disciples and says, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. What has quintessentially been Jesus' vocation is becoming ours too. So we must ask, what is the Master calling us to? Today's verses from Mark chapter 8 have a lot to say about Jesus' vocation to suffering. They begin with what is known as the first prediction of the Passion, the first of three. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering, be killed, 
and after three days rise again. Now very clearly the disciples in this account do not have the benefit, like the first Christians say in Corinth, of having witnessed the crucifixion and experienced its impact in the community of believers. This, for them, is yet to come. The thought, therefore, of Jesus being crucified is entirely new. It is also anathema, and we see this clearly in Peter's response, who took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. Crucifixion was a particularly harsh and degrading capital punishment that was reserved by the Romans for ruffians and slaves. They would crucify tens, even hundreds at once, so we are told by the historian Josephus. Crucifixion was certainly not for esteemed leaders. We can understand Peter's protestations. But as readers of the Gospels, we share, along with the Corinthian Christians, a knowledge about the saving death of Jesus. We know that through his death we live. We're inclined, therefore, not to hear these words of his with the starkness they would have had to the disciples who first heard them. It's good, therefore, if we can put ourselves in their shoes and hear Jesus as if for the first time, declaring what his calling is from God, to undergo great suffering, be killed, and after three days rise again. Today is an opportunity to stop and listen and take this in. We also observe that today's crucial portion of Scripture that signifies both Jesus' vocation to suffering and the vocation of his followers to take up their cross is sandwiched between two great proclamations of who Jesus is. In chapter 8, verse 29, it's the same Peter who declares, when asked, that Jesus is the Messiah. Then in chapter 9, verse 7, in the account of the Transfiguration, it is the voice of God that announces, This is my Son, the Beloved. Listen to him. These two clarion calls from the text serve, therefore, as two kind of bookends that point us towards what happens in between. This textual construction acts as a signpost, telling us, if we hadn't quite got it first time, just how important this vocation is. Interestingly, it happens right in the middle of the Gospel, in chapter 8 of the 16 chapters of Mark's Gospel. And it should be thought of as the heart of the Gospel good news, that this Jesus, who is the Anointed One and the Beloved Son, has a divinely ordained vocation to suffer, to die and to be raised. And this is the foundation of our faith. We are familiar with Jesus' response to Peter's rebuke. It's in the strongest possible terms. Get behind me, Satan. And the sharpness of Jesus' rebuke is yet another indication of how important this teaching is about his true vocation. The same can be said of the call to his followers to walk in the way of the cross. If at ten days into Lent you're still pondering what to give up or to take up for Lent, today you have your answer. Take up your cross. Would that more of our Lenten observance led us more deeply in this direction. For there can arguably be no better time than Lent and no better time than the present for us to give thought, prayer and consideration to the meaning of the cross for our lives. Jesus says, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it And those who want to lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. In childhood, I worried a lot that if I was to be a good follower of Jesus, I might have to countenance being crucified. This is one of the problems of the literal mind of the child. And I may not have been alone in this. As an adult, I'm struck by the fact that the cross is not really about Jesus himself even though he must wrestle with accepting his vocation of suffering, praying in the garden that the hour might pass from him, yet not what I want, but what you want. Rather, the true focus of the cross is God's great desire and passion for humanity. The cross 
is a means of salvation. The obedience of the Son is a part of that endeavour, as we know from Paul in Philippians chapter 2, where he speaks of the Lord humbling himself and becoming obedient to the point of death. But it is not the goal. In a similar way, our calling to take up the cross as followers of Jesus is not really about us, in the sense of being about something we have to do or be or agree to. It is rather, I'm inclined to think, about a willingness to be used by God in the great arc of salvation bending towards humanity and creation. It is a dispensation, an openness of heart and mind. From Philippians 2, we sometimes forget that Paul introduces the passage saying, Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. The calling to take up the cross is a habit of heart and mind that we receive through Christ by grace, through his Spirit working in us. This leads to the thought that in the same way that we sometimes talk of being co-creators with God in fashioning the created world, so we are surely also co-collaborators with God through grace in ushering in his salvation, the healing, wholeness, reconciliation and blessing that can come about through taking up the cross and walking in the way of suffering love. And we have surely witnessed some extraordinary examples of people being used by God to walk this costly and risky road in the circumstances of the pandemic. Our frontline workers in health and social care, so many people in public and retail services, both in the foreground and in the background, have set aside their own comforts and risked their lives to be out there in the danger zone, sometimes as a professional necessity, sometimes through personal decision, and at other times as the only way to put bread on the table. And this tide of suffering love has made all the difference, both to those in peril and to the rest of us who have been shielded from the storm to a much greater extent. And this reminds us that our calling as Christians to walk this way with Christ is forever open to us. We can almost attempt to walk away from the suffering of others, but this, this is not what our Saviour asks of us. As Archdeacon Paul referenced in a recent Bible study, when we seek transformation in the world in Christ's name, we bear in our bodies the scars of his passion. We walk where he has travelled, on the way of the cross, because this is the way that God chooses to redeem what is broken in the world. The brokenness of human lives and of the planet and the injustices of society are out there waiting for us. To take up the cross is our surest weaponry for the healing of what is broken. But whilst Christ's road of suffering was necessarily a lonely one, plumbing the depths of the darkness of God, ours need not be. Why? Because he walks with us. When we take up the cross, he is holding the other end. John Bell's lovely hymn, Jesus Christ is Waiting, captures beautifully this calling at the heart of discipleship. The final verse expresses especially well how the way of suffering love is a path we walk in step with the Lord. Jesus Christ is calling, calling in the streets. Who will join my journey? I will guide their feet. Listen, Lord Jesus, let my fears be few. Walk one step before me. I will follow you. Amen. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, 
begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through whom and the things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified in the Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Almighty God, we pray for our church. We pray for our local community. We pray for shops and schools. We pray for peace in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for people who are sick. We pray for hospitals. We pray for the virus to go away in the name of Jesus. We pray for the Lent season. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for Mr. Hester, Millie, Huma, Daniel, Doreen, Margaret, Debbie, Rosario, Francine and Jennifer, Gerald, Steve, Enoch, Diani, Nima, Paul, Judy, Marianne, James, Eunice, Emma, Stroop, Theolola, Be Oki, Ember Heeper, Maria, Christina, Lulu, Yumi, Ali Reza and his father Reza, and mother, Shanaz, Vince, Christine, Sahar and his son, Sahil, Sajan and Payam, Maji and his mother, Habiba, Coral and Susan, Amir, Mawa, Nidin, Ali Koff, and her children, Harold, Haley, Hazel, and Hayden, Ellie and parents, Ashley and Garam, Vahid, Stephen, Milad, Mani, and Kamla, Parminda, and Jessica and Parvinda. We pray for those who have recently died. Especially remember Michael Cox, comfort his loved ones, John, his wife, and family. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We offer our prayers with those of the saints, saying, Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> He will not command legions of angels, nor ride the machine of holy war. He will become a servant, take our hate into his heart, and win us with forgiveness. For his is God's unexpected peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you, and also with you.
You'll find me with the broken in the weak in the spaces in between. You'll hear my voice cry out with those who weep. Only if you're listening, what? and your way, the path to life. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right and good to give you thanks and praise, Almighty God and Everlasting Father, through Jesus Christ your Son. For in these forty days you led us into the desert of repentance, and through a pilgrimage of prayer and discipline, we may grow in grace and learn to be your people once again. Through fasting, prayer and acts of service, you bring us back to your generous heart. Through study of your holy word, you open our eyes to your presence in the world and free our hands to welcome others into the radiant splendour of your love. As we prepare to celebrate the Easter feast with joyful hearts and minds, we bless you for your mercy and join with saints and angels, forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We praise and bless you, loving Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord, and as we obey his command, Send your Holy Spirit, 
that broken bread and wine outpoured may be for us the body and the blood of your dear son. On the night before he died, he had supper with his friends, and taking bread, he praised you. He broke the bread, gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again he praised you. When supper was ended, he took the cup of wine. Again he praised you and gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it. In remembrance of me. So, our Father, we remember all that Jesus did. In him we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross, bringing before you the bread of life and cup of salvation. We proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes in glory. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Lord of all life, help us to work together for that day when your kingdom comes and justice and mercy will be seen in all the earth. Look with favour on your people, gather us in your loving arms and bring us with St Chad and St Mark and all the saints to feast at your table in heaven. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory are yours, O loving Father, for ever and ever. Amen. Believing the promises of God, as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until, until he comes. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy upon us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy upon us. Jesus, Redeemer of the world, give us your peace. Give us your peace. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy upon us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy upon us. Jesus, redeemer of the world, give us your
as we prepare to join ourselves in communion with Christ, you might like to hold out your hands or make an action that you usually would when you come to the altar rail. Now imagine Jesus, Mary or one of the saints coming to you in a gracious and kind manner, holding out to you the blessed sacrament. As you see them approach, say, Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word and I shall be healed. And say together, my Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things and desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. ایسای من معتقدم که شما در نان و شراب مقدس حضور دارید. شما را بالاتر از هر چیزی دوست دارم. می خواهم شما را به روح خود پیوند دهم. از آنجا که من در این لحظه نمی توانم تو را به صورت نان و شراب دریافت کنم. حداقل از نظر روحانی وارد قلب من شوید. من تو را در آغوش می گیرم که گویی قبلا در آنجا بوده ای و خودم را کاملا با تو گره می زنم. هرگز عیسی من هرگز اجازه ندهید که از تو جدا شوم آمین Let's pray Almighty God you see that we have no power over ourselves to help ourselves keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls that we may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body, and from all evil thoughts, which may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May the crucified Christ shatter our brittle fear, draw all people to his glory, and make us servants living for the world. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be with us all evermore. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.
Bambe, 